Okay, so Ezra Nehemiah, it's the name of the class, Let Us Rise Up and Build, subtitle. First lesson in this series, uh, Jewish Historical uh, Timeline. I, I was thinking that uh, in order to uh, better understand the return of the Jews, you know, we know the story of the Jews taken into captivity, into Babylon, so on and so forth. In order to understand the return of the Jews from captivity, and how this occurred over a period of a hundred years. A lot of times we think, oh, it, it happened all in one day. One day, you know, the, the Jews said, oh, we're going back. 70 years is up, let's all go back. Well, it didn't happen in that way. It, it happened in, you know, in groups. So uh, in order to understand this a period of a hundred years, it'd be helpful if we reviewed the timeline of Jewish history from about a thousand years BC which would be the beginning of the era of the United uh, uh, Kingdom. Uh, this period, beginning around 1500 BC, would be approximately uh, 500 years after Moses led the Jews out of Egypt and into the uh, Promised Land. Uh, during this time, the Jews, uh, as we know, settled the land that was given to them by God and at first they were ruled by family and clan leaders from the 12 tribes of Israel. And from time to time, God would send a special spiritual or military leader like Samuel, for example, or Gideon, in order to guide or to lead the people in battle against uh, their enemies or to have a spiritual uh, renewal from time to time he would send these leaders, we call them judges, and we have the book of Judges talks about that. By the time we reach roughly 1000 BC, the people no longer wanting a theocratic leadership, and that's what it was, God himself was leading the people from time to time sending a judge, but it was basically a theocratic uh, uh, leadership. They didn't want that anymore. They didn't want God to lead them directly through the judges and the clan leaders uh, that he had raised up and sent to them. The people demanded to have a king. They wanted a king to lead them and they wanted a king uh, for the most natural of reasons. They wanted a king because everybody else had a king. They looked around them, all the countries around them. They had a king, a glorious king, a king dressed in fine robes, a king with a crown. You know, only they didn't have a king. So they wanted a king uh, as well. And so uh, God permitted Samuel, one of the judges, last judges, um, who had led the people for many, many years to anoint for them a king. And from this point on, we begin the timeline that we're uh, talking about, that we're going to be talking about. So here's, uh, here's how we're going to look at that timeline. It'll have four headings. First heading will be the date. Uh, the dates that I'll put down are approximate dates, since there are various opinions over exact years, but the events mentioned are within uh, you know, several years before or after the event uh, is cited. Some events are exactly on the year, historically we can find it. Other events, you know, there's, a, you know, there's some discussion uh, either way, but we'll put the, the, the dates there. The next, uh, the next column will be the events themselves. And in the timeline, I'm only going to put major events that will be included in order to provide, you know, a bit of a, the flow of history. Uh, by noting the highlight movement. So you're, you're kind of knowing what's going on by, oh, okay, this took place, this, and then this took place, and then this took place, you know, the order of when certain events took place in uh, Jewish history. And then the other section, the prophet and the books. A lot of times there were several prophets who wrote about the same events since they lived at the same time in history. Uh, one of the assumptions that uh, some, sometimes that we make is we think the prophets were linear. There was this prophet and then, you know, a hundred later there was this prophet and then uh, 50 years later there was that prophet and then so, no. Uh, there were many prophets that lived at the same time and they talked about the same thing. They, they prophesied about the same events. They lived during the time of one king. So I'll put in the timeline which prophets were alive during the events uh, 
that we will be uh, uh, talking about and it'll help us uh, and clarify their writings and their relationship to one another, meaning the, the prophets themselves and the time that they lived. And then the world. Uh, the Bible was uh, produced to maintain a witness and a history of God's creation of the world and his creation of mankind, but specifically to record the following. And that would be the sin of Adam and its consequences, God's promise of an eventual salvation, and God's plan and fulfillment of this promise beginning with, no, uh, beginning with Adam uh, to Noah, to Abraham, to Israel, to Jesus, to the apostles, to the church, to the return of Jesus, to the eternal life of God's people. The Bible talks about those events. The point that we have to note here is that the Bible is a historical record, but it's not a historical record of the world. The arguments of, of atheists you know, saying, well, the Bible doesn't talk about this, and that he mentioned this particular important person and so on and so forth. Well, the Bible was not written uh, to record the, you know, the history, uh, the linear history of the world and all of its uh, people. Uh, it is a historical record of God's promise of salvation and the fulfillment of that promise through Jesus Christ, who appeared on earth in history as a Jewish man. Remember, I think it was in uh, Exodus, we talked about the golden thread. You know, remember the golden thread? The, 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 this golden thread that starts at creation and you follow this golden thread. <laughs> Sorry about that. Golden thread, you follow it all the way to the, you know, the, the, the prophecies of the end of the world when Jesus will return. There's lots of other things happening up here and down here and over here and over there in the world, you know, but the Bible is not concerned with those things. It's concerned with following that golden thread of history, uh, dealing with God's promise to the Jewish people and ultimately to believers in Jesus Christ. That's the, the thread of history that the, that the Bible is following. Oh yes, the Bible does mention important people, certain kingdoms, you know, that kind of cross uh, you know, the Jewish timeline that come into contact with the Jewish people, but there are some peoples and some nations that it doesn't even mention at all. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist, it's just that the, they're, not, uh, they're not salient to the, to the uh, story that the Bible uh, does, um, uh, does mention. Now, this doesn't mean that the historical information about the world events in the Bible are not accurate, the information about the world and the events in the Bible are perfectly accurate, but they're not of primary importance. What's of primary importance is who were the Jews and what were they about and what was the promise and how did God fulfill it and so on and so on. That's, that's the story of uh, the Bible. And so, as I said, the main story of the Bible is the salvation of mankind, not the history of mankind. Uh, so let's begin with our review of our timeline. Now that you know what the, uh, you know what the boxes are. So we begin, we begin in a roughly 1040 uh, BC. And as I say, we'll look at the, we'll look at the, uh, the information and then make some comments on those. And that's what this first lesson is going to be, just to set the timeline where we're at, okay? So 1000 BC, roughly the beginning of the United Kingdom. In other words, Israel is ruled by one king. We know Saul, the first of these kings, uh, ruled for 40 years. Uh, David was the next king. We read a lot about him. We know a lot about uh, David, 1000 BC, 961. Solomon, his son, one of his sons, uh, also ruled the uh, United Kingdom. Those are the main events of this uh, period, that golden thread, if you wish. Lots of other stuff was happening in other places, you know, but as far as we're concerned, as far as the Bible is concerned, this is the information, this is the history that it's giving us. And then the prophets, and the the prophets who lived and the books that they wrote about this period are the following, first and second Samuel. Well, Samuel was the one who anointed Saul and also David. And so therefore, you know, we have a lot of information in his books about these kingdoms. Uh, First Kings chapters one to 11 talk about this period here. 
All of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles chapters one to nine talk about this period. Uh, the book of Psalms, of course, uh, written primarily by David, uh, the book of Proverbs uh, and the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon. These books, these prophets, these people, they write about this uh, particular uh, time. Uh, in the world, no, no events are mentioned in the world in our timetable, but the various prophets and chroniclers of the period describe uh, numerous interactions and wars with surrounding nations that existed at that time. But the Bible is not about that. It's not about you know, the interaction of the Israelites with their neighbors and with the various tribes that they were eliminating in order to conquer the land. You know. uh, so the Bible doesn't talk much uh, about, uh, about that. Uh, next uh, period is the what's called the divided uh, kingdom. Divided uh, kingdom. Uh, so the events, the beginning of the divided kingdom, I'll explain in a second. The prophets and the books that talk about the divided kingdom. First Kings, the second half, 12 to 22, talks about this period. Second Kings, all of it. Second Chronicles talks about this period as well. And, and in the world, the most significant thing as far as the Jewish nation is concerned is the rise of the Assyrian Empire and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, I think this is a familiar story to most of us. Solomon's son Rehoboam alienates the 10 northern tribes of his, uh, with his economic policies and, uh, and causes a, a split in the kingdom. And uh, we read that he retains the tribe of Judah largely because his grandfather, uh, King David, was from this tribe, and Jerusalem was the seat of power where both the king's palace and the temple were located, so that naturally Jerusalem was the, the seat of, the seat of uh, political and religious power. Uh, also, the tribe of Benjamin uh, remains loyal uh, because of its location. Uh, it was in the south, and the first king, King Saul, uh, was from the tribe of uh, uh, Benjamin. And so you have a split in the kingdom. Uh, the two tribes in the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin, uh, they remain uh, loyal to Rehoboam, the, uh, the son of, um, the son of uh, Solomon. And then the 10 northern tribes uh, gather together uh, and they name Jeroboam uh, as their king. Um, and uh, Shechem as their capital. And so the northern tribes kept the name Israel to identify themselves, and the southern tribes uh, became the kingdom of Judah, and they began to identify themselves uh, using the name of the primary tribe uh, that remained uh, faithful. At first, it was all Israel, all 12 tribes were Israel, but when they split, the northern tribes took that name Israel, the southern tribes took the name Judah, and that's where sometimes the confusion uh, might come. Uh, note that some of the books like 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles are divided, telling the history of both the United Kingdom and the divided kingdom. And then of course in the world, the most significant event that will later have a great impact on both kingdoms, north and south, uh, will be the rise of Assyria to the north as a world uh, power. So there you see, this is, we're keeping it simplified so it's easy to see here. Uh, there you see there, Samaria uh, in the north, uh, Jerusalem uh, in the south, northern kingdom, uh, southern kingdom, Assyria to the north, uh, it's about this size, but it, it begins to uh, expand uh, with, uh, with time. Uh, next uh, period, uh, 722 uh, BC, some of the events that take place, the succession of rulers uh, for the north in Israel and for the south in Judah, each 20 kings go by that we read about, 20 kings. Uh, the prophets that talk about this uh, period of uh, the divided kingdom, Jonah, uh, Joel, Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, uh, 
So we have a major prophet, Isaiah, long book, right, Isaiah, but we also have uh, the minor prophets, Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Micah. These prophets were talking, uh, living during this time and talking about the period of the uh, divided kingdom. In the world, once again, the most significant factor, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria is spared by Jonah's preaching. We wonder, when did that happen? Well, you know, I mean, it had to happen when Assyria was on the rise. Uh, it had to happen when Nineveh was a city of prominence uh, because, uh, you know, it was a threat to the North and South Kingdom. It had to happen at a time where a Jew would hate uh, Assyria for one reason or another. And so uh, this, this is the time uh, historically that uh, many uh, scholars believe that uh, Jonah went to preach uh, in, um, in Nineveh. Uh, let's see. The Lord also sent several prophets to each nation to both warn and encourage them over a period of two centuries. Uh, again, many scholars uh, place the prophet Jonah's preaching at this point in history. 721 BC. Uh, Assyria under the king Sargon and then later his son Sennacherib conquered the northern kingdom and relocated the people throughout the Assyrian empire in order to assimilate them. The people who were carried out became known as the lost tribes of Israel. Why were they lost? Was it because they didn't know how to find their way back to uh, uh, northern, uh, you know, northern Israel? No, they were lost because the Assyrian um, method of uh, conquering a people and uh, weakening them, making them subservient, uh, was to erase their history, uh, was to dilute their religion. And the way they would do this is they would, they would uh, you know, conquer a people and then take the people and spread them out into the different parts of their empire so that the people who were conquered would intermarry with other tribes and they would take on other religions and they would take on other customs and so on and so forth and therefore dilute any remaining uh, loyalty they may have had to their original, uh, original country. It didn't happen after a year or two, but you know, after a lifetime, yeah, my grandfather used to live there, but we've been here now, you know, whatever country, we've been here now, you know, 50 years or something, you know, and I married this girl and, and you know, and my son married another girl from this tribe, you know, so all of a sudden you don't have any history anymore. They became the lost tribe because they were lost to Israel. They were uh, uh, assimilated. Uh, by pagan, uh, by pagan uh, nations. And this was on purpose. This is how uh, Assyria didn't just do this to the Jews, they did this to every uh, nation that they, uh, that they uh, 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 conquered. Uh, also, uh, we read uh, about other prophets who wrote uh, concerning this uh, period, uh, especially the fall of the Northern Kingdom, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, uh, all uh, minor prophets uh, who prophesied and warned about uh, the coming uh, of the Assyrians, uh, 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 of, the, of the cauldron, you know, the hot cauldron uh, uh, go going to be poured over the northern uh, kingdom. Uh, and also in the world, uh, as I say, Israel carried off into different foreign lands by Assyria. Then, uh, as far as world history is concerned, Assyria itself is destroyed and taken over by the Babylonian uh, Empire. And uh, the Babylonian Empire is, uh, is established. 721 BC and thereabouts. Next period, 587 uh, BC. What happens uh, to the Jews? Uh, now is the fall of Jerusalem and the Southern Kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar uh, of Babylon. Prophets, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, you wonder who are they prophesying about? Well, they're prophesying about the Southern Kingdom. They're talking about Jerusalem. They're warning, they're pleading. You know, God is pleading with them. Stop, stop doing what, so something terrible is going to happen. In my own personal uh, Bible reading, you know, like you, I also, you know, daily Bible reader, you know, try to keep up. Uh, 
I'm not trying to figure out a sermon or anything. I'm just reading the Bible, just to read the Bible itself and you know, gain some personal insight, whatever. And I'm reading Ezekiel. I want to tell you, boy, that's a tough slog going through Ezekiel. That, oh. Yeah, yeah. I'm having a great day, it's a wonderful day, whatever, you know, my, my projects are going great, supper is, on the, supper is on the stove, I can smell it coming, oh man, I'm just gonna do my Bible reading, gonna have a great supper, we got a nice movie queued up, you know, uh, for later on, I got some popcorn going, you know, and then I read Ezekiel, oh my. <laughs> I mean, it's gloom and doom, it's warning. I have to remind myself that he, he's not necessarily talking to me, you know, he was talking to the Jews in Jerusalem, you know, repent, stop, stop doing what you're doing, you know, it's awful what you're doing, you're prostituting yourself. And I mean, in, in the most, uh, in the darkest of, of, of imagery, uh, he continues to warn these uh, people about what is to come. Uh, and not only him, but others as, as, as well. Uh, and of course, in the world, uh, eventually Babylon, uh, the Babylonians do come and uh, they, um, uh, they overtake uh, uh, Jerusalem, they capture Jerusalem uh, and uh, they carry the people off into uh, captivity. Now, uh, the, the Babylonian foreign policy was different than the Assyrians. The way the Babylonians functioned is that they, they kind of took the cream of the crop you know, the best of the best, you know, young noblemen and so on and so forth. And uh, they wouldn't kill them. They wouldn't send them off to different places. They would, they would bring them into exile into their country and they would take the best of the best and they would retrain them uh, in Babylonian language and art and literature and politics and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, after a long period of retrainment and so on and so forth, they'd send these people back to the countries that they had conquered as rulers uh, because they not only understood the culture of the people, but they also understood the culture and the politics of the nation that they uh, now served. And of course, a great example of this is, uh, is Daniel who rises to prominence uh, in this uh, system. Uh, and then of course the next uh, event that uh, took place is that the Babylonians themselves are defeated uh, by the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Uh, now once the uh, Babylonians are uh, defeated and the Medo-Persian Empire is established, uh, the scene is set for the uh, portion of Jewish history that our study is going to examine. So all of this has just been to bring us historically to, okay, where are we gonna uh, study? So our study begins at this point here. Once the Babylonians are defeated and the uh, uh, Persian Empire is established, uh, the scene is set for the return of the Jewish people back to their uh, country, back to their, uh, back to their city and their, and their, and their temple. Uh, this would not be possible with the, uh, uh, with the Babylonians uh, in the same way, but it was under the uh, Medo uh, Persians. Also, we have the prophecies. You know, I said Ezekiel and uh, Jeremiah and these uh, prophets were uh, prophesying uh, gloom and doom. But at the end, uh, one of the things about prophecy, there's a kind of a cycle, you know, uh, the first is be careful, you're heading into trouble. Uh, the next section of most prophecy is uh, you better repent, it's gonna hurt when God punishes you. And then it's okay, God's gonna punish you and this is what he's gonna do to you. And then there's always a section at the end, but the Lord is merciful, uh, but the Lord is kind. You know, he won't wipe all of you off the earth. He's gonna save a part of you, a part of you he's gonna save. You know, there's always hope. Uh, no matter how doomy and gloomy it gets near the end of the prophecy, there's always a, a glimmer of hope there. And in Jeremiah, the glimmer of hope is they're gonna be a remnant. God is gonna take a remnant and he's gonna bring them back into the land. And these people are gonna be faithful and they're gonna rebuild the temple and so on and so forth. You know? And so that prophecy we see uh, fulfilled uh, um, in the period when uh, uh, Jewish exiles are sent back from the Medo-Persian empires back to Jerusalem in order to rebuild their homes uh, 
and uh, the, uh, the temple. And so through God's mercy and care, he, uh, he uh, preserved a fraction of the original kingdom of the 12 tribes through whom he would fulfill his promise of salvation uh, that he had made in, um, in Genesis. So how the period covering the return of uh, the Jews from captivity covers about a uh, hundred years. The return and the rebuilding was done in stages. Like I say, some of us think, oh, 70 years are over, everybody get up, we're, going, we're all going back to Jerusalem, all in one shot. But as we read uh, in various books, uh, it didn't quite happen. The, the prophecy was fulfilled, but it didn't happen in that uh, particular way. First of all, 538 BC, uh, the first group of Jewish exiles returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Shesh Bazar, Shesh Bazar. And there is a prophet who writes about this uh, period, Haggai the prophet. And of course in the world, the thing that releases these people to return home is something called the Edict of Cyrus, who was the Persian king uh, at the time. So little is said uh, of this uh, except in uh, the book of Ezra. The objective was to uh, rehabilitate the land and to rebuild the city and the temple. The first Jewish leader chosen, I told you, was Shesh Bazar. He's mentioned in, he's not mentioned in Haggai, but he's mentioned in uh, Ezra. This particular, this first group established the cities. They laid the foundation of the temple. However, they faced opposition to their work. And so the work was stopped. The initial work was stopped. It was delayed for 16 years. The building program was then revisited after the prophet Haggai exhorted the people to leave off building their own homes and vineyards and return to building the temple. And that's why I put Haggai there. He was the first prophet that encouraged the people, come on, you've stopped building. You're, you, know, you were brought back here to build. You've stopped building. Let's get back to work. Let's get back in to do uh, God's work. So that was the return under Cyrus. Then there was another return, uh, 516 uh, BC. Uh, the second temple begins reconstruction and uh, completion by Zerubbabel and Jeshua. The prophets or the books that we read about uh, or that talk about this, Zechariah and Esther. And in the world is a period of uh, the Persian empire various leaders, Darius I, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, uh, then Xerxes I and Xerxes II. These were the world leader at the time. So in 516, uh, they return another group and the objective here was to complete the building of the temple itself and the life that would revolve around the temple. And this particular effort was led by Zerubbabel and uh, Jeshua. Uh, a little about these uh, fellows. Zerubbabel had originally come with the first group led by Sheshbazar, and he became the leader of this fresh effort to complete the temple. So they, had one sh they took one shot at it, and then several years later, another group comes, okay, with Sheshbazar, uh, with Zerubbabel, and they uh, make a second effort to rebuild and to complete the building of the, uh, of the temple. Uh, Zerubbabel was the grandson of King Jehoiakim. Uh, Jehoiakim uh, was the king who was released from prison and allowed to eat at the Babylonian king's table uh, for a time. So Zerubbabel was a descendant of the, this you know, last uh, Jewish uh, king. So he had this uh, royal authority, if you wish, this leadership uh, history in his family. And Jeshua was the head of a household of priests. Now, this renewed effort to complete the temple was also opposed, uh, but with the encouragement of the prophets Haggai and now Zechariah, the work was finally completed. Next uh, section is uh, 457. Uh, Ezra is appointed to train priests and to begin teaching the people. Uh, 457 uh, BC, 
Uh, of course, the prophet here is, uh, is Ezra. Uh, his is a particular story. We'll be talking more in depth about him because the series is called Ezra Nehemiah. So this is where Ezra comes in. Uh, they've had a couple of returns. They've had a start to rebuilding the houses and the cities and the, the main city and the, you know, they've laid the foundation of the temple to rebuild it. Then a second group comes along and they start putting up the walls of the temple. And now we need to have people to manage, to lead worship. So what the king does is he appoints Ezra and sends him uh, to Jerusalem to begin training uh, and recruiting priests and uh, to, you know, to uh, reestablish the religious life of the uh, people. And then 445 uh, BC, uh, this is the return under Artaxerxes I, 445 BC. This is where Nehemiah returns to rebuild, not the city, but the wall around uh, Jerusalem. And of course, he and Ezra uh, work together and they dedicate the finished uh, work. Uh, uh, prophets that speak about uh, this time, of course, Nehemiah, uh, his book, we're gonna be talking about that. Again, the series is Ezra, Nehemiah. So this is where Nehemiah comes in and of course, Malachi, the last of the prophets of the Old Testament, and we have the close of the uh, Old Testament. And so it is at this point where the, where the histories of, of Ezra, who's sent back to train the priests and so on and so forth, and Nehemiah, who's sent back to rebuild the wall, where their lives cross at this period. And, and this is what we're going to be studying what happened during the time when these two leaders, when their lives crossed at, a, at this particular junction uh, in history? Uh, Nehemiah, we learn, uh, was a cup bearer. You know, he served the wine to the king, uh, but actually his was a privileged position in the royal court. Anybody who was that close to the king had a privileged, uh, a truly, a privileged position. He's probably a, also a, um, an advisor to the king. Uh, there's no mention of a wife of Nehemiah. So many scholars believe that he was a eunuch uh, at that time. Anybody who had that access uh, to the king, close to the king, close to the, the, you know, the, the levers of power, so on and so forth, if they were men, um, uh, were eunuchs uh, to discourage them from trying to uh, build any type of uh, uh, a family or uh, descendants or uh, any type of dynasty. There's the word I was looking for to try to build up any kind of dynasty to take over uh, the, uh, the throne. Well, a couple of reasons why they had eunuchs uh, serving uh, politically at the, at the top of uh, power. Uh, we know about um, uh, Nehemiah that he goes back to rebuild the wall and he establishes social order and eventually he's named governor of uh, that uh, particular area. Um, he returns uh, then to Persia for a time, but then he's called back to Jerusalem to reestablish uh, the uh, earlier focus. Things start to fall apart. He's got to go back and crack the whip and get everybody back in line. We read about that. And our theme for this series is, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, let us, ri let us rise up and build. And that uh, the theme comes from uh, uh, chapter 2, uh, 18 of, um, of uh, Nehemiah's book. Then Ezra was a priest. Interesting character historically. Uh, he, had a, he had an official position in the royal court. He was responsible for Jewish affairs. He was a kind of a secretary of state for Jewish affairs. A lot of Jews in the, uh, you know, as exiles, but also throughout the uh, kingdom and back in, 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 in Israel. And uh, he was responsible for, you know, maintaining information and what was going on with the Jewish people uh, uh, to inform the king. Well, we see him several times in the process of the Jews return to their country. Uh, and his claim to fame is he reestablished the function of the temple. He authenticated the priestly lineage. He uh, dedicated the wall when it was finished and he reestablished the reading, the copying and the teaching of the law. What good is rebuilding the temple if you've got nothing happening at the temple? 
It's like building a big old church building. You got pews, you got everything, but you haven't got any preachers, no teachers, no elders, no deacons. You know, what good's the building if you don't have these people? Well, that was the point. Uh, they built, they rebuilt the temple, you know, but they didn't have uh, the priests, they didn't have the Levites, they didn't have a system, they didn't have the law, no one was teaching the people. And so Ezra uh, was chosen to go back and to reorganize and to, to set all those things uh, uh, in, in motion. So uh, we see a process of God's people being gradually returned to their country over a period of a century. The land is refurbished, the cities are rebuilt and inhabited, the temple and the wall of the central city of Jerusalem are rebuilt. In addition to this, social reforms are established to create peace and harmony. And finally, the central focus of the people, which is the worship of God, is reestablished through a renewed priesthood and a temple, uh, 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 temple service. And so we get to the last date in our chart here, 400 BC, 400 BC to Christ. Uh, some of the events that take place during this period of time, uh, a Greek domination, in other words, you know, one empire follows another, and so the Greek empire takes over, defeats the Medo-Persian, they're the uh, world dominating um, uh, power at the time, uh, and their influence is very strong, their psychological, philosophical, literary, uh, linguistic uh, uh, um, um, influence is very uh, powerful to the point that in Judea, uh, the Jews uh, were no longer speaking Hebrew. They couldn't, they couldn't read their own uh, texts uh, anymore. So strong was the, the power of, 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 uh, of Greek thinking and Greek language. Uh, and so they had to, make a Greek, you know, they had to make a Greek copy of the, uh, what we call the Old Testament. They had to make a Greek copy of that so that the modern people could actually read their scriptures in a language that they uh, understood. And uh, so that particular uh, copy was made uh, and called the Septuagint. Uh, when you hear about the Septuagint, uh, it is the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew uh, scriptures and they call it the Septuagint, Septuagint 70, because 70 scholars were recruited uh, in, the, um, in the production of that uh, particular uh, uh, work. Uh, there was many other things going on you know, in, 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 in Judea. Uh, they were ruled by uh, Ptolemy of Egypt. Uh, there was the Maccabean revolt. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, Christ is born, Maccabean revolt. Uh, they, were, they were at that time revolting against uh, the rule of Egypt, against the power of Greece. Uh, it was really a religious revolt, uh, trying to maintain the purity of the scriptures and trying to maintain the purity of, the, of Jewish worship. And it's during the Maccabean revolt that you have the rise of, actually they were the champions at that time uh, who became villains, but uh, the Pharisees. You know, we always talk about all oh, the dreaded Pharisees, the legalistic Pharisees, but the Pharisees are the ones that rose up during the Maccabean revolt. They're the ones that said, you know, back to the Bible, let's keep things pure, let's not let the world, let's not let the Greek you know, philosophy uh, intermingle with our religion. No, we want to separate ourselves. Well, that's what you know, Pharisee means, separate one. You know, they were the separate ones. So they were the heroes of that time. And uh, we see what happened with them over a period of 100 years. You know, they, they carried the idea of being separate and uh, you know, um, following the law uh, uh, carefully. Uh, they carried that idea way too far and we see where they're at by the time uh, Jesus arrives on the scene. The prophets, of course, there are no inspired prophets during the uh, period, uh, what we call the intertestamentary period meaning between the two testaments, okay? There's about four centuries there. There are no, um, there are no uh, uh, inspired prophets, but that doesn't mean people weren't trying. <laughs> it doesn't mean people weren't writing a lot of books. Uh, we have the apocryphal books or the hidden books, they call them, uh, Ezra's examples, the book of Judah, the book of Maccabees and other books. Uh, you know, when there's a vacuum, there's, uh, something needs to fill that vacuum. And so there were no prophets in Israel. 
And so people rose up and began writing things, you know. Today we call it science fiction. They didn't call it science fiction, but today we call it science fiction. All kinds of phantasmagorical things that were uh, going to take place <clears throat> when the Messiah would come. You know, there's a lot of Messiah coming books and prophecies. He would be this, he'd be a, he'd be a military. You know, you ever uh, hear the preachers say, uh, so, uh, you know, the Jews thought he might be a military leader. You know, well, that comes from here, the intertestamentary period. You know, who's the Messiah going to be? Well, he's going to come along and be a military leader. And so powerful is he going to be, he's going to be able to break the yoke of the Greeks or the Romans or whoever is oppressing us and return us back to the golden period, you know, Solomon and the temple, when all nations you know, uh, would look to Jerusalem for wisdom and for leadership and so on and so forth. You know. So this, uh, this is why when Jesus comes along, <laughs> he says, you know, love your enemies, forgive your enemies, you know, and, uh, turn the other cheek. You know, Jesus comes along as a, a poor carpenter from the north, uh, not quite exactly what all these uh, writings were about uh, during the intertestamentary period. And then of course in the world what's happening, Alexander uh, conquers uh, Persia, and then of course the history, right, that Daniel writes, eventually uh, the Romans. Rome becomes the uh, primary country and defeats the, um, uh, defeats the Greek uh, empire. And so uh, Judea now is under uh, the authority of Rome. And uh, that sets the scene, doesn't it? Uh, a, couple of, a couple of lessons from this and then I'm, I'm through. Uh, first lesson, um, 600 years, you know, we, we've, gone, we've gone through 600 years in 30 minutes here, you know, from, from 1000 BC to, to 400 BC or so, 1000 years, you know, and, and, and through all of it, what is it that we see? You know, God is always ministering to his people. No matter how bad it gets, God is ministering to his people. And that never changes. In the first century, the church is established and then the Romans are you know, persecuting the church and they're scattered and they're... Uh, they don't even have the word written down yet. And yet God is ministering to his people. He sends Paul the apostle and he sends others to, to preach and he raises up elders and evangelists and God ministers to his people all the time. Uh, 2024, God ministers to his people. It doesn't matter what's happening. Uh, in America, there's going to be a war. The Russians are going to take over. We're all going to be speaking Chinese in 40 years. You know, God ministers to his people. Always, always. That's, that's the lesson. And maybe the other lesson is God never lets them go. He never let the Jews go. I mean, he started with a big group, right? 12 tribes. And he went down to two tribes and he went down to just a, just a, a small group that left and went to, uh, to Babylon. And then, uh, and then not everybody who went, that small group, that few thousand that went, not all of them came back. A lot of them stayed in Babylon. You know, they had stores, they had houses, they had fields, they had farms. You know, they, they, they didn't decide to go back to Jerusalem. Why should we go back there? The city's broken down, you know, everything's crashed. Only a little tiny bit of people went back to Jerusalem. And, 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 and the thing that we find out is that God never let his people go. The people who don't let go of God, God never lets go of them. There's the lesson. The people who never let go of God, no matter what, God never lets go of them. Remember that because that's a lesson for today. All right, thank you very much for your attention. We'll get into the actual books themselves next week. God bless.